Good waving going on. Well, on welcome everybody to the meeting of the implementation committee for Pemba. Uh, we have, I think, one apology from Alexa here. Yeah. Um, happy, happy to move that for you. That's cool. And, and Kate will second that. I'll put that motion, those four. Right. Right. Again, carried. Thank you. We have, I think, four on Zoom. Um, Michael Deca, Carmen Hope, Rich and Robinson, and Michael Laws, is he there? Yes, he is. Yes. yes. Cool. OK, uh, we don't have anything in the public forum. Um, we'll take the agenda as agreed and find five agenda items. Are there any conflicts of interest to be noted? If not, I move on to confirmation of the previous minutes, the 11th of August. I'm happy to move those minutes. We, and we've got a second, um, Councillor Calvert. Hillary, thank you. I'll put that motion on those four. Aye, aye, aye. against, carried. Right, the action register. Uh, what have we got there? Uh, first item complete, a second item complete. Third item, environmental quarterly update in progress. I don't think we need to discuss that. I think they are all good. Any comments from relation to the actual items? Okay. Um, question about the third one. Yeah. Um, the, um, the rab yeah. The, the rabbits are seen as the number one in some ways. Um, they have a more annoyance. The, the possum, I'm, just, I'm doing this very clumsily, sorry. Uh, Carmen and I have been doing what you do at this time, the, the trainium. And we've been meeting people who are very concerned about possums exploding in numbers after Osprey have left an area um, and the consequences of biodiversity and the risk to TB, which are substantial as well. Um, and I'm just wondering, when, when you're doing this review, or, um, is it limited to rabbits or is there scope to do consideration of that because these things are moving beasts and possibly are only just leaving some areas now. I think it certainly clearly says rabbits. Yeah. Is that is that fair? <clears throat> I, I think in relation to the point that you raise, actually... I can ask it later. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, and um, to be fair, in our second agenda item, yes. we, um, there is the potential to... Well, that that's why I'm asking it now. Do I need to add it in, or is, is it just going to be rabbits? Here? This is principally rabbits, and I suspect if, if um, there's quite a workload in that, I suspect. Um, that one only relates to, we're not doing the effectiveness of the plan per se. Uh, Gavin? We're delivering on the action, which yes. is specific to rabbits. It's Got well that. underway. We've had an external piece of expert uh, advice prepared. And we're just turning the recommendations from the expert into a set of actions that we will bring back to a committee for endorsement. Cool. Specific to rabbit monitoring. Okay, so I'll do it under the other report. Thank you. Sorry, Kim. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just further that action point, then what, what is the date for that? Just so I'm working with, and uh, Libby will know that, of an Andrew Harvey who, who was quite upset about the, the way the rabbit procedure is going. Um, so is there a date for when that would come back? Kevin? Yes, Mr. Chair, we're aiming for one of the earliest committees of the new uh, training in December, something like that. Yeah. As I said, we've had the review done, we're just turning it into actions and we'll report that to a committee so we're aiming for around December or January. Thanks so much. So, should we put in there December 2023? 20, 22. 22. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure procedurally you can change something, but this is just report back on progress with an action and the resolution you've already made. Oh, yeah, maybe. Okay, well, we look forward to that feedback. Thank you. It's certainly been discussed here in the middle. Um, Okay, we're going to move on to our first agenda item, the Environmental Implementation Quarterly Update, and we'll invite Libby, the author, Libby Caldwell, and endorsed by Gavin Palmer. Thank you. Um, while they get seated, I'll say the key points as I see them. Well, certainly the purpose to provide a quarterly summary of the operational activities, implementation activities undertaken in the areas of freshwater, biosecurity, and biodiversity. Um, there's some key points in the executive summary where ORC is leading and delivering full jobs for nature projects for a total value of 22 
0.5 mm-hmm. million. Uh, Otago as a whole is a total of 28 jobs for nature funded projects, totaling 61 million. I think of which four of them, the ORC is the funding agent. The projects are expected to create something, something in the order of 500 jobs during the implementation. Uh, the Council's Integrated Catchment Management Program is underway. The restoration program at Lake Hayes is continuing. The management plans for Tomahawk and Lake Field for Take are being implemented. The Eco Fund projects are underway with all successful applicants notified. The community led rabbit management projects continue to be implemented in accordance with the overall project plan. And Otago's delivery of the National Wild and Conifer Program continues. So there's a lot going on, Gavin and Libby. Any comments to your report at this point? No, no, thank you. I think you've given a good overview. We'll just take the report as read and see if there's any questions or comments. Cool. So I've got uh, Hilary to my left. And, and I think what I'll do in terms of this report is, is when the topic is raised, I'll invite anybody else that's got a question or a comment in relation to that particular topic. So, but nevertheless, still put your hands up and I'll take a record of that. So it's Hilary. And I've also got Kevin down. Okay. And you've got me too, I hope. Yep. The two Michaels. Yep. Okay, Hilary. Just, I might have missed it, or perhaps it doesn't belong in here, but what about the rooks? Um, there, through the two, there is a section on yeah. rooks in the report. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I must, just missed it. Um, Don't need to bother with that then. I'll just do better at reading. Thank you. We didn't, on a positive note, we didn't have any um, rooks, a uh, confirmed rooks. Yes, I read that in the paper. I just didn't um, okay. identify with it. Okay. Kevin. Uh, just an initial question on uh, paragraph five. We were uh, around the catchment teams and your work doing with catchment groups and communities, etc. cetera. Uh, it says uh, we'll develop various education behavioral change work programs is near in completion for delivery. And I just wonder what, what, what um, have these education and behaviour change work programs been tested with the sample mark, the market sample? So when you've developed it, have you gone to the market and say this will fit in your community or, or how, how has that been done? So you meaning for um, if we check with that community if it's an applicable program for them? Is that what? Is that what yeah, you're yeah, and, and if the way you're talking going to deliver it to different communities will work within those communities. Yep, so we will do that as we roll it out. We haven't done it in the development of the programme, but they're flexible programmes. So the two key ones that we are in the process of just finalising as we speak are stormwater and um, septic tank education Mm. programme. So those are looking at engaging with the general public, so not specific to a a catchment group or an area um, and we can adapt our, our style depending on who we're working with for those and um, it, it's a good idea to pilot it in an area so that's what we will look to do yeah. um, in those areas that have got the biggest problems first. Thanks Ali, thank you. Cool, um, we've got Andrew's name, before I go to one of the Michaels, um, was there any other discussion around that particular point, stormwater and septic tank? I've just got a um, for Councillor Calvert, I think the Rook stuff is in the operational plan report. So that's the third report that oh, we're going to okay. present. So it's just wide. so that yeah. um, I just had a, a memory in that it's not in this overarching one, it's in the, the third one. Uh, yeah, the third one. Oh, cool. thank you. Okay, no further discussion on that topic, Storm Order Septic Tank. So I'll move to uh, Michael Baker. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And thank you, Libby, for a very comprehensive report. Uh, I never thought I'd see the day where so much money was spent on environmental projects across Otago. It's incredible. Um, the fact that it's central government money doesn't matter. We're playing a key leadership role in it all. And it's just great to read all this stuff. My question is, though, it'll be comparatively minor from what I've just said. Uh, in the first part of the report, I think in Clause 6, Libby, you talk about the Lake Hayes restoration work. Um, and a, a key factor in it being changes in market conditions. And I wonder what that means uh, in terms of an environmental project. Are you referring to the Arrow, Arrow Irrigation Company and 
having other demands on the water which we require for restoration purposes? Or, or is there something else in a so-called market that I don't understand? Chair, I'll, I'll own that in my words. Uh, what I was meaning is uh, basically the inflationary environment. And so we, we've seen the cost of, uh, or the estimated cost of physical construction works and equipment prices have increased when compared to when the estimates were first prepared. And it's because of the inflationary environment that we're operating in. Uh, supply yeah. chain issues. Uh, some, yes. some, some gear, for example, has to come from Europe and we're finding, we've found that uh, we can't get that gear in a timely fashion. So that's what I mean by those words. Oh, thanks, Gavin. That helps a lot. Um, and I guess you're referring mainly to the uh, construction work for the outlet from Lake Hayes. Uh, yes, I am, uh, Councillor Deke. I'm referring to the culvert Cold. at the outlet. I'm also yeah. to the uh, the completion of the offtake structure uh, that introduces flushing water into the lake, into Mill Creek, and the associated equipment. Okay, so AIC is not being obstructed in any way. No, not at all. In fact, um, AIC have been very, very supportive to us all through this process, and we have a very good relationship with them. Great. Good to hear that. Thanks, Mr Chairman. Cool. Is there anything else? Any other comments from anybody in relation to Lake Hayes? If not, I'll move on to... My question, sorry. My Lake Hayes question has now been answered by Gavin. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I'll now go to Michael Laws, and I reckon he's going to talk about the rabbits. Um, well, you're half right, as you usually are. Um, I guess the first question is um, in relationship to the lake strategy, which I haven't seen an update from here. So you put out that for tender, and I think it is. Where are we with that? Um, through the chair, um, Councillor Mead, the team is managing that contract, but the work is underway. Um, I can wish um, a written update to councillors if you like. Um, get some more detail. I, I'm not across exactly where it's at. Wouldn't it normally be here in this report? Sure, Mr. Chair, no, it, it ordinarily wouldn't. That's a strategy piece. This report focuses more on the implementation side of our, our work. But we'll it's, get an it. it's an implementation of a council policy, though. We'll get an update. Oh, okay. Okay, how will you do that? Will you formally advise us at our next council meeting or something like that? Well, we can provide an email on where the tender process is at in terms of... Okay, yeah, that's that's good enough. Now going to the half-right part, um, rabbits. Uh, the last time I inquired, night counts were about to be done. Have they been completed yet? Um, who's going to answer that question? I will answer um, that. Through the chair, the night counts are currently... Um, underway. So majority of them have been completed, yes. Okay, so when will they be completed as a total? Um, Murray, do you have any dates there? Yeah, through the chair, it's Murray Borden speaking. Um, we've got two final um, night count routes to be completed. They've been delayed because of weather um, and lambing at the present time in South Otago. Um, all the other ones have been completed. Right, so we've only got two outstanding in South Otago. So when we, we might we get the report coming to this council? Uh, I would expect a report at the next implementation committee meeting. Which is what, three months away? I'm, I'm uncertain of the dates. That's too far away. Um, I, Mr Chairman, I'd like to see those reports when they're completed. So if it's the next implementation committee, I don't think we've got another one before the, we rise. And then we go through the training. So it'd be nice to have that information. Well, while, you were, while you were talking, I was flicking through the report, paragraph 77, 78, um, Libby, and, and, and Murray, that, that gives an update on what, what has happened in the last financial year in terms of the number of rabbit inspections. And then the notice of direction process that's currently going on. Uh, and some type of audit there. And so your question, uh, Councillor Laws, is you're after 
a more current update of where things are at in terms of numbers of rabbits. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, this is pretty vital. It's our number one pest. Uh, the, the night counts are only two properties away from being completed, which and they're in South Otago. Yeah. Then those figures are probably pretty available to us almost now. And we'll know from comparing that and putting it into, I think we've got a six year spread, um, whether or not our program is having any impact or not. Yeah, so just going yeah, back through that, that answer there, Murray, you're, you're saying most of the data is there. So when would that be expected to be presented to the, to the council? Um, the analysis needs to be done, and I'm completing that at the present time. Um, and then we've got to compare it to um, past um, night counts to see any trend analysis as well. Um, the report will be generated um, in due course um, to achieve the um, um, the proper analytical uh, um, procedures. Okay. And so we can, we can generate that um, within a month or so. Okay. And Gavin, you were going to comment as well. Uh, yes, well, it'll be to the first opportunity we have in the new triennium in respect of a committee, but I was just talking to Ms Caldwell as to whether we could do it sooner. Yeah. And I just think we should just go away. I don't want to put Mr Boardman on the spot right now in yeah. terms of what he needs to do. Yeah. But if we can find a quicker way to get it to the committee members, then we will do that. Okay, so there's a possibility you might just email it out? Is it like well, we'll try, what I'm saying is we'll try and find a way of getting it to the committee ahead of a proper committee, if that's possible, or we'll look into it. Cool, I think that's pretty uh, responsive, Michael, yes? Michael Laws? Three, three months waiting until the next implementation committee, I just didn't want it to last that long. Yeah, and, and they've responded to that, so your point's well made. Any, any other comments? Uh, no, 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 that's fine, thank you. Um, is, okay, I'll open it up. Is, is there any other comments on rabbits? Okay. Uh, yeah, just um, comment on the Moraki uh, group that are working underway, yeah. um, which I did bump into the leader of that group and a whole heap of the people involved that they're pretty happy with what's happening. There's always a fair majority of people are uh, getting on board with it. Uh, they've got, had a few hiccups, but uh, none, none of them are doing. You just had a, a comment in there, and I'm sorry, I haven't got a page number. 23 uh, out of 115 is rabbits. About the rabbit carcasses that you've been testing. So has anything come, have we found anything good that we can use to kill some more? <laughs> we haven't, unfortunately. So we will prepare a proper report on, um, on the information that's been found. But um, the indication is that it wasn't a Khaleesi virus or an RHD virus um, at this point. Um, so we... We've had testing done through Manaki Fenware on some rabbit carcasses um, and they didn't find any conclusive evidence that that's what that was. So, um, and they've suggested that there's nothing else that we could test for as well. So it's an unknown event, um, which did knock back the rabbits for a little bit, but they will bounce back and we don't get them under control. Okay, I think we're done with rabbits, yeah. Looking around, is there any hands on Zoom? No, Kate. Sorry, I wanted to go back, apologies. I, the job's for nature, I didn't have my hand up in the right to report it. Um, and I'm really excited by all of these things. 503 jobs is just amazing um, to create. And when we talk about market level pressures, I would have said that this is one that really is um, in the game. Getting 503 people at, over all of these projects, I think it was, um, to do that work is, to my mind, a risk. And I'm just wondering how we're managing that risk. Um, but that's, that's for all of the Targo cases. I appreciate it? that. But so we've got quite a lot of those. We've got four of those. 100, no, we've got 100, yeah, 100 people, 100 FTEs yeah. um, of those. And so what I, the question is, I don't think it's an implementation question, but is that risk or how you're tracking against those um, numbers being reported somewhere? Because I'm just thinking, I'm wearing my audit and risk hat here. Yeah. Um, because I want to ensure, I know how hard it is, and I'm having sleepless nights with one of these other projects doing this stuff, because they're huge undertakings. So how are we managing those risks and ensuring we've got the staff yeah. that we need for those, and where does that get reported to? So through the chair, through our quarterly reporting to MFE, we report on where we're at with yeah. jobs and what we've achieved for those four projects. Um, Obviously, the Te Hakapupa restoration project and maintaining the gains early on in their um, 
in their project in their project delivery so we still need to do some recruitment to fill some of those roles through our RFP processes and that kind of thing um, <clears throat> but it will be reported through to MFE and they will make sure that we're delivering what we yeah said we are. if we're not that becomes a risk for the council because we may not get the income in so the question is is that being reported to audit and risk if we don't and and it's just I'm just closing the loop it's great that we're doing the projects, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but it's our risk as a council. Well, what, what, sorry, why is, why is that? I'm not trying to be silly. No, so we, we've committed to doing a project. We're yes, getting and we're doing that project. And we're, and we're getting millions of dollars in for them. Yes. If we don't create the jobs, we don't get the money, but we still have to, um, so there's a real, we, we may have contracted to do some of the work, but we're not necessarily going to get the money in if we don't create the jobs. And what they count as a job is a moving piece, as I understand, in some some aspects of it. So, Libby or Gavin, is that right? So, like for our four projects, for example, maintaining the games, roughly a million dollars. We said eleven people. If if there was only nine people, do we only get a proportion of that? Um, I'm not. I can answer that. Look, it's not as it's not as precise as that. You know, yeah. it's not a pay per person kind of yeah. thing. Um, but clearly, if you don't deliver um, substantially on the um, intent of the agreement, then there's possibility of money not being paid. Okay. Um, but I'm not. I'm not close to where those numbers are at. That's something we can follow up on. Okay. If, if the answer, if the question is, do we have any concerns at the moment on delivery? Then the answer is no. And and that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I just want to yeah, make sure that there's a loop that's closed that we understand yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've got another question, but yeah. another matter. No, far away. Kate. No, I think Louis going to ask. I've got another that. question about. Cool. Yeah. That. Yeah, I've got a question on that too, please, Brian. Um, I'll give you half a question. <laughs> I would have thought, following on from Kate's query, that um, <clears throat> all the contracts we have of this type through the gov for, for the government or something that we would report to the government. We should also have on a register of risk things that goes before audit and risk, because it seems to me there's a, isn't there a, um, and this is really sort of a question for you, Gavin, isn't there a list, uh, isn't there a risk that we have already established of us um, being part of the piggy in the middle of some of these jobs and ending up with somebody at one end giving us some money and then not getting, um, not delivering. I mean, it, it's a, it's a clear and certain risk, and we several years, uh, or uncertain, whatever. We, we don't have a way of um, tagging it, any of them as a as a risk, and reporting back on. Yes, we've got the money. Yes, the government has said that we've done it. Yes, they've released the money. Yes. Okay. Um, Oops, Gavin, have you got a response to that in terms of the risk to the audit committee? Um, <clears throat> I agree there are risks by entering into these agreements because we are um, being obliged to deliver something for central government and independent on others outside of our organisation to deliver on that. And that creates a risky situation. And when you start to build this kind of level of stuff, you're obviously increasing the risk. It's also happened in a very short period of time. Um, so, so yes, it is um, creating both risk and opportunity for us. As to how that features in terms of reporting and where it reports, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that question, but I take the point. So perhaps that's something that perhaps that's something you could on. you could raise with our chief executive as to how how that gets because it doesn't just get reported to government. It's not a government. Gavin, um, I'm sorry, I just popped out because Kim was at the door to drop off some papers, but so I might be repeating something you've already said, but you just shared with me the other day that actually we're quite conservative around uh, the amount of funding that we've got for Jobs for Nature and, and um, because of this very reason that we didn't want to overpromise um, by doing lots of projects that we might not be able to deliver on. So uh, I, I remember you sharing that with me just recently. So I, to some extent... This is, it's a tricky balancing act. We, we want the work done. It's, it's a huge number of projects, by the way, that we're involved with one way or another. 
And um, but yes, obviously there's always risks associated with either not being able to find the staff or not being able to complete the work. But but am I quoting you correctly, Gavin? Uh, yes, um, my comment was in respect of the climate resilience shovel ready, ready engineering projects. Uh, our four projects, which total about $8 million. And Dr. Boren's correct in that we were very careful when we asked for money from the government to put up a very small number of projects that we were confident we could deliver rather than everything we would like to get money for. And I think that's turned out to be a good decision. Obviously. Okay, so, so, sorry, Gavin. I, I, obviously, I was quoting the wrong set of projects, but 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 I, it's still helpful to have that conversation because um, uh, the, 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 yeah. Thank you. Can we just rely on yeah. Kevin, Kevin and, and um, our chief executive to find a way of bringing that through the audit and risk cool. system? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael Lord. You've got a comment on this topic. Yeah, um, I just wanted to have, uh, I'm sorry, it's probably been in a previous report, so if it has been, just tell me to bugger off. Um, the, oh, let's just take the uh, National Wild and Conifer Control Project, which is 13.4 million, 45.81, don't know how they get to that, FTEs. When, what, I, what I'd like to know is when will these projects start? Do we have a time in which they must start by, have we signed a contract to that effect, in a time when in which they conclude? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, so they're, they're all underway. Um, the Hakapupu, as you know, has been, has been reported, it's been a slower start there, but it's still underway. Uh, in relation to the Wilding Conifer program, that is a finite program which ends in 2024. See, I would think that your chance of getting 45.8 FTEs up here to do that work would be nothing short of heroic. But it's already commenced, isn't it, Gavin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the Wilding Conifer program has been underway now for, well, we're halfway through it, really. It's a yep. four-year program. Yep. So you're telling me you've got 45 full-time staff out there now attacking Wilding Conifers? Um, through the chair, I don't know the exact numbers, but we can get them for you. <clears throat> like big... We've got a lot of work going on in the wild and conifer space through contractors. Yes. How, how, how much is this a continuation of of the wild and conifer work that was previously going, or is, it's a boost? It's a boost up, is it? Yeah. It's, it's on top of. It's nothing like it. It's been a massive ramp up yeah. on this yeah, council yeah. into something where previously we were making a very modest funding contribution only. Yeah. To now actually um, being right in the heart of delivery through being contracted by central government and then contracting numerous entities in the community and experts to deliver stuff who will yeah. create jobs in their businesses. It's now um, one FTE plus in our organisation and even that's too low probably just to keep on top of this workload, but it does end in 2024. Cool. So it's, it's happening, uh, whether it's necessarily 45 yep. is it something that will be looked at. Um, that well, no, but that, that's the next thing. These these people, the, these FTEs, now I've finally, we're, we're, they're not employees of ours. Is that correct? That you've subcontracted out this contract to contractors. Is that right? For the chair, yes, that's correct. So is that all of those projects? Um, yes, for the majority of those projects, mm -hmm. those numbers are not staff there might be one or two project managers as yeah. part of that but that um yeah and all these projects are just for a period of time it's not forever if i could add that importantly they're intended to create enduring jobs in the community so they're kind of a, a kickstart if you like so the intention is to create new jobs in the community to upskill people and create opportunities so when the central government funding ceases hopefully that then yeah. continues they've got jobs to continue because they have been upskilled and supported in terms of getting into work. Yeah, and we'll talk about that next possibly. Well, it's just that I, I find that hard to believe with when you've got to finish the wild in conifers in 2024. The, then somebody's going to have to front up with the same amount of money to keep those people working in wild in conifers, and all they've been trained in is killing wild in conifers. So I'm struggling here to see how, yeah. um, without us putting $13 million in 2024, um, yeah, the same wilding conifer contribution would carry on. 
Chair, we're about to move up uh, seven point two is uh, large funding requests, yeah. uh, and that covers what I think would be the probably the part to talk about that because that yeah. does how yeah, we continue from these uh, funds, the Wild and Crime Fund and the likes going forward. So yeah. yeah. Cool, cool. In fact, if there's no further discussion, we might wrap up this topic. Oh, oh sorry, can I do another topic? Yeah. Um, hold yeah. that thought, Michael, um, for the next Good report. Thought. I've got Kate and I've got Kevin. Okay, and apparently Carmen's hand's been up for a period of time. So I've got uh, Carmen, can I invite you to speak, please? And then Kevin and... Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, Co-Chair. I just had my feeling was a little bit different and it may be for the next paper, but I'll just, uh, I'll pose the question if I may. I know you've been talking about risk and things like that, but what I wanted to ask Dr Palmer was a lot of these jobs that we've obviously been doing and we've been in on time and um doing a good job so you know one are we are we moderated by people that we get the money from number one and number two does that look favorable on us for other projects that's what i wanted to know when when we have um concluded our work you know compared to other councils and how we fed now that might question for 7.2 and i'm happy to hold it over if it is Who wants to answer that? <clears throat> so the answer is that um, all of those central government agreements have some sort of monitoring framework around them because the government yeah. obviously makes sure that, that we are delivering. Um, I think the question is possibly more pitched towards the climate resilience engineering project, yep. which have gone, um, are going very well for us. Cool, we'll talk about cool. that later. Later, I think, yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Kate and Kevin, was it on this topic? No, it's no. on 32 for me. Okay, so we'll go uh, Kate first and Kevin. 32 and 33 paragraphs numbers of uh, working with the catchment groups. Thank you for all the work you are doing in that space. It's great. And I know you've ramped up some brilliant staff in there. The question I've got is about the spatial data, environmental spatial data and the GIS work, because I am hearing that that's one that community groups really need. And I'm not quite sure that... Um, that their expectations that are necessarily what we're delivering. And I'm just wondering at how that has been rolled out and how we are doing that. Or are we waiting until we've got our integrated catchment management working better? Um, Is that part of that? So through the chair, we are responding as we can with requests from our community engagement groups to provide maps and information to them. I guess because the team is relatively new, they still need some upskilling and how to produce these maps that have the level of detail that is needed so that it's sometimes it does take a little bit more time um i don't know of any specific oh, examples sorry. Uh, sorry. um and maybe this is again that meet, meeting of the expectations with what you think they need mm -hmm. um and what i then spatial data is files of gis of what those areas look like in um and shape files at, at a quite a complex level um and i however had it expressed from one catchment group which i don't have anything to do with was that having access to a safe GIS online that you've got would be easier than everyone recreating this elsewhere. And it also means that then we own the data should a group hold up. Yep. And I'm just wondering if we can, um, how well, and maybe the conversations to have at a catchment wide scale with the OCC maybe. Yeah. Um, so what's yeah, the philosophy yeah. of our council, you know, Libby, in terms of presenting that information? Because there's a bit of work in it. Yes. Um, so through the integrated catchment management work and the catchment action planning, that will become easier because we'll have dedicated resource to be able to create this and, 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 it, and it, the intention is to have an online platform that's accessible for people to use. So Which is great for the Catlins, but not for the others that aren't there yet. Yeah, so we have to, I guess, um, adapt as best we can to, mm -hmm. to meet those needs. So we need to understand what they are and, then, and we can go away and see if that's something that we can do. Yeah, look, I, I'm raising it. We put up rates over the last two years by a substantial amount of money. Yeah. This is the one. This is one of those areas we can add a huge amount of value to those catchment groups without um, adding cost to them, and at the same time capturing their data. And I just think there's a disconnect from what I'm hearing at the moment. Um, and I don't want to do a resolution for it, but I'm hoping that we can explore that yeah. we, um, so that we do have some resolutions for the next meeting, uh, for, uh, for the next council. Okay, so. Yeah. Is that something you can take away, Libby? And yeah. 
Thank you. And, and the quiz you again. Oh, thank you, Kate. Kevin. Oh, uh, I've got two, two wee things just to finish off. Um, so number 19, your initial task for the ICM working group, just uh, excellent that you're going to do the stop take and we'll find out what's actually, actually happening in those areas. So that's, that's a really great initial step. And if I'd just like to go on to page 30 onto something dear to my heart is wallaby eradication. And it's probably just... Just more than we're not cheating many wallabies. But no, we're not. We spent a lot of money for each wallaby the, 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 the most expensive wallaby to shoot will be the last one. And that's uh, Gavin Uddy, who's leading that team, uh, pointed that out to the, to the group meeting that we had in, in uh, Ranfilly just the other day. We are bringing, uh, we will be talking with one of the actions from that group meeting. Uh, we'll be talking to Amanda and Libby, the, the high country uh, contractors and Gavin and his team will come and present to the new council to show you exactly what the new technology that they're using and how that program is going. So I think they'll be, and we'll just table that with him and Amanda and co just to get that into the, as early as we can into new triennium just to show uh, what's happening there, that, that it's very good money well spent. Cool. I reckon the first one is costing a lot of money because I mean, how many wallabies have we actually shot in this last period? Uh, I think it was eight. No, it was, yeah. Yeah. yeah, in the last How would you know it was the last one? There you have it. So that's where you've got to keep looking. So that's why when you do get them, it's one and expensive. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Gary. You need to throw something at me. You might yeah. do heat the next one. I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tempting, so, tempting. So, what have you guys won me over when I, they let me fly their drone? That was incredible. Um, going back to Walden Pines, sorry, just a question. <coughs> we are signalling the end of the programme uh, and the funding that's available for 2024. Sorry, I missed the meeting that was held, um, but the, was a clash of another meeting. Um, the two Walden groups, are they satisfied that, you know, we are seeing a ramping down now in the next financial year of the hectares that they're proposing? By 2024, are they, gonna, are they happy we will have mostly the last hectares done or will there still be hectares left over to do following that? Is it a program that's going to need to source other funds to continue on? Um, through Mr Chair, look, I can't comment on um, where things will be at that point compared with where we, we would like to or need to be, but certainly there's a, there's a high level of awareness of the termination of that central government program. And it's something that's being discussed nationally because it doesn't just affect us as to um, what happens next. And MPI is certainly aware of um, the consequences of an abrupt cessation to a program and the uncertainty that's created at the moment about not knowing what's going to happen next. So it's certainly a very live issue. And at that workshop in Alexandria, which was very successful, it was very good to listen to the groups, uh, MPI and Department of Conservation, um, it came up for discussion. Um, and everyone is well aware of it. Because I think we have very well resourced contractors who have been able to find you know, good teams of staff. So I suppose if that is all going to finish, but there's still heat gears that are needing to be done, then we have to find a way to continue yeah. that. And maybe that leads on to the next report, Gary. Is that okay? That's right. Um, um, if there's no further discussion, I'm conscious of time as well. We've got two uh, recommendations, both to one to note the report and secondly to note the range of implementation activities. Big thank mm -hmm. you, Libby and Gavin, for all the work that's gone on. Gavin's I'll moved. Second Hillary second. I've got the motion. There's four. Aye. Like yes. Carrie. Okay. Let's just have the second report. <clears throat> Large funding requests. Um, so I'll invite uh, Anna to the table and um, see Richard Ewens is also involved. I don't know if that's left. And endorsed by Gavin. Thank you. Um, the purpose of this paper is to describe how site led programs and predator free partnerships have been addressed by the ROC today and to outline the current options within the ROC to support opportunities for biosecurity really collaboration with biodiversity out with the external parties. And I, I make the point, and it's, it's been brought up a number of times in the previous report, that, that this particular issue does not only relate to just predator free Dunedin and potentially the Southern Lakes Sanctuary, although they initiated this discussion, but also in relation to wilding pines uh, or possums in the Catlins or continuing jobs for nature uh, projects 
when the central government funding dries out. And that's assuming there's a need and so forth. Um, I, Anna, before I, I, I come to you, I also point out paragraph number 11, which, which says that the um, Southern Lakes Century request illustrated that a more strategic approach to investing in large scale site led or otherwise community biosecurity projects is appropriate rather than ad hoc consideration of such projects at draft annual plan stage. Currently, OIC does not have a consistent process for considering projects like Predator Free Dunedin and Southern Lakes Central. And, and I thought that was a really important paragraph. And these issues and opportunities are coming up to this council. So I'll just invite Anna, uh, Olivia or Gavin, who wants to make a, any brief comment to this report before we open it up? Is there any comments? Through the chair, we'll just take the paper as read and take any comments or yeah. um, questions about what we've yeah. done. And before I go to Kate, I make the point that we recommend that this is a noting report. <coughs> um, uh, nevertheless, I'm hoping it, it may initiate some positive moves for Kate. I may have missed it in the report, but I'm going to refer to paragraph five. Um, other regional councils do not appear to have formal methods for assessing large scale funding requests. And the, the reason for that, I think, in a number of councils is that they actually do it themselves. Um, and I think the two examples that have been given to me well, in the last few days when I've been out talking to people about possums, because that's been a hefty topic on the campaign trail, there's that Horizons and Taranaki would be um, working with Osprey and coordinating the approach themselves. And the question is, did you consider that as an option? And if not, why not? So some, I think that's how some councils do it, or have I got that completely wrong? Um, okay, so yeah, before, before I pass it over, like, I mean, these are all options for discussion. And I suspect even the scenario that you illustrated is still going to cost some money and some resource and so forth. Absolutely. Anna? Oh, uh, through the chair, just, um, it's a good question, uh, Councillor Wilson. And I guess the um, initial answer would be that we weren't discussing this paper around what's the outcome we're desiring, but how do we, as a council, assess when we get these large partnership requests for funding, so regardless of whether they're for possums or biosecurity or um, other environmental works. So if, um, if the question were more, how do we approach possums, then that would, that would be an option we would look through. But the question was really about how does council consider requests for funding at, at, this, at this scale, 1.5 million over several years of a commitment. So um, my apologies for that. Not oh, no, no, your question. Well, no, 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 that's a, really, that's a really good answer because I think what we're doing is reacting to the community's yes. sense that there's a need, but we haven't understood and done anything proactively to get into that space that there isn't, I mean, in the Catlins, uh, sorry, not Catlin, or both in the Catlins and in the where Osprey are about to withdraw, and in the um, Clinton area where they have withdrawn, people were just reporting possums galore on the road as at night. And Carmen has heard the story as I have. And those are sort of things that are triggers that would, if we were in that proactive space. So we don't want to get to the, to the space. And so I suppose the environmental outcome that we want is not to get to the point that people are noticing the road kill. That's right. And, and as you'll be aware, we have had some discussions around integrated pest management in the Catlins and yeah. um, are looking at a proposal for, for um, cool. avenues there. Thank you. Thank you. And, and hopefully address that <clears throat> in much more detail through the catchment action planning process. Again, but that's slow for those. This, I'm just reiterating the need to get catchment management up going everywhere as soon as we can rather than. Cool. And before I go to Hillary, um, before <laughs> I go to Hillary, I, I might just signal to Pim that I might come to you for your, a comment from you at some point um, because you, you have talked to me previously about, you know, making these strategic decisions and, and how do we. Um, yeah, how do we do that exercise? I'll come to you if that's okay. Um, yeah, that's hurry. fine. Oh. Hurry. Um, seems to me that we've sort of asked this question, question asked about face in the sense that what we, that's a technical term, sorry, it's not, <laughs> well, I'm intended to be offensive to anybody. That's a legal term. Uh, as long as you're not but, charging, it's okay. What we, 
what we do is we do something, we provide a priority and then um, PIM organises for our staff to carry it out if possible directly or like with the jobs for nature things, we completely contract somebody else to do them or in between times, we might have some sort of partnership arrangement with other people to do them. So those are our sort of three models. And this is one of those three models. But we've asked the question as if it's, how do we give money to a community group for a large scale thing, rather than how do we carry out the priorities we've committed to in the most effective, cheapest, best priority, best community outcome way. So the question behind that is, could this be, as it were, rewritten if the question was different, namely not how do we find a way of giving big lots of money away rather than small lots of money, because that's how the question sort of here. Instead, how do we use a partnership model to more effectively carry out the priorities we've got in our long-term plan? You know, would it would it be the same paper written slightly differently to get? Do you just see the distinction? We're not looking for more ways of giving people money necessarily. I mean, we started off thinking it was bigger amounts, but only if they're part of our strategy should should we be using money. And that's so. How 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 it fits into the strategy would be if we were asking the question: How do we use that second option, namely doing things in partnership, to carry out our strategic direction? Would would this be the sort of, would you okay. just do something different with this paper too? Have you got a comment on that, Anna? Um, yes, if, if that's allowed. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, to be fair, we uh, looking at resolution provided to us, which was Absolutely. specifically yeah. around a reaction yeah. to a request. Yeah. Um, so our, our question. And your, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, if, however, the question was, how do we, uh, implement what's already in front of us, the LTP, biosecurity strategy, biodiversity strategy, operational plan, RPMP, integrated catch management program. We're fully we're fully committed. We are they are our priorities. So um, exactly that the the rightly or wrongly the, the the work plan for three years is is there, and we um, apart from you know some curly questions around potentially resourcing or curveballs or things that happen in between like COVID and we are on that path. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This this question was more yeah. about does ORC have a process to deal with um, uh, but large well in this case large funding requests in a partnership format. This one happens to be about biosecurity primarily. Um, putting it up against the comparison of Pit Predator Free Dunedin Southern Lake Sanctuary ones yes mm. ones no why yeah where's the, the consistency and transparency. So your question is very valid, but unfortunately um, we worked with. What was in front of us? Yeah, I'll, I'll, sorry. But so the other part, if I may, of the question would be how would we then put it back into our framework, namely be saying if we somebody wants to work with us, what is our strategic thing? What funding have we got to carry that out? How can we stretch that funding further and yeah. Because then we could be asking a question which we get the answer to why this group rather than that group. And it's not because we funded this rather than that. We funded this program because it's a priority for us or because we can get twice as much bangs for our bucks for it or something. So, And in, and in order to do that, um, yeah, we would be proactively looking for those partnerships to help us deliver and leverage resources to record to, yeah. to get more runs on board because there's yeah. nothing in here that says how this fits in with our priorities or so um there is a table yeah. in there about the strategies and the um current actions in with and um, yeah. objectives within strategies that this yeah. kind of request would fit within so it's not off the table yeah. for us to consider it yeah. but we don't have a process for considering it okay thanks Hillary. i'm, I'm going to go to um go to pim before i do i'll just make the comment that um it we may have identified our number one priority, but we still mightn't have, you know, the, the funding to actually support it. And there may be this huge opportunity or even a responsibility. And how do we actually 
address it or support it. Um, I I was there, you know, in relation to the Prevent to Free um, in the Halo project and the 1.5, you know, um, the three 300,000 a year. And I think to a certain degree, probably the less said about it, the better. In terms of it was a process, it was a decision that was decided really sort of quickly, you know, probably for good reasons, but nevertheless, it was, um, and as you say, with the Southern Lakes come up with a similar type of scheme, you know, similar type of priority, why did we support one and not the other? And the predator free will have a termination date. And then you know, they'll come back and ask the same question. And unless we've got some framework in place, we don't find it difficult. So, huh? and, then, and then Michael Deeker. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Brian. <clears throat> um, yeah, look, I, I, I think the comment that I had with you, which, uh, with you maybe, Brian, which you alluded to, was that actually it is the council's role to be strategic, and I'm not sure that we spend enough time on strategy, and that's exactly what various people, Hillary included, and Kate, have, have just been discussing. Uh, I think I think there's a, a, a place for us to have this conversation around the council table for staff to bring you some of that thinking and for you to do some of that thinking around how we can be responsive uh, and proactive as a, 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 you know, how to be proactive, occasionally responsive, uh, rather than always reactive. And, and there are opportunities. Uh, so what do you do when, when somebody says, let's partner with you, uh, we'll put in half the funding? Um, if it's not in our long-term plan, it's not a priority, we haven't got the budget for it, does that mean that we're never going to be nimble enough to take advantage of that? Uh, I had an example of this where we were nimble enough recently when Gavin showed me the work, some of the work we'd done on uh, strengthening stop banks in the Tyree uh, Plain uh, because there was some funding available for shovel-ready projects. So uh, my view is that we do need to be nimble enough to respond to opportunities. And Jobs for Nature is a great example. I mean, it'd be a mistake to look to miss out on all of those opportunities because we're stuck completely with what's in our long-term plan. Now, the world changes. A great example uh, we've just talked about in possums. You know, Osprey's job, I know Osprey well because I was chief executive there, actually interim chief executive. Uh, look, they, they're only interested in killing TB. They're not interested in killing possums. So once TB has gone off farms, uh, they will stop killing possums, and that means the world changes, and suddenly we've got lots of possums, and maybe as a regional council, we need to fill that gap. But we've got to have, we've got to think about that change in the world. It may not happen, it may happen much more quickly than the next opportunity to look at our LTP. So, so uh, having those strategic sessions with council, in my view, is around creating some uh, a space in our budget for being responsive to opportunities, but it's also around ensuring that council is telling us what the priorities are for our region. Uh, so we can't do everything for everybody, but there are, you know, mostly the LTP is supposed to be setting the priorities for, for us in terms of the things that we believe are, are most important in terms of supporting our communities in some of these areas. Um, so so that, I suppose that might summarise my thinking on this, Brian. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael Decker. Yeah, thanks, Brian. This, this is a really, really big issue. <clears throat> and I think paragraph 53 reminds us that we're only looking at the surface of it here with Southern Lake Sanctuary. There are lots of other projects which would love to get hands on uh, the kind of money we put into Predator Free Dunedin. And Brian, I agree with you that that decision to support PFD uh, was made in a rush, under pressure, um, uh, by some very uh, pressure from, from very articulate people and we found it impossible to say no. And th that's fair enough. In hindsight, I guess we would have probably made the same decision again Yes. Uh, because that project was set up to go and all they needed was cash from us and we gave them the cash and off it went. I can understand Southern Lake Sanctuary saying, hang on, uh, you know, Predator Freedom Eden is all very well but what about us? Well, there are massive landscapes and our massive problems of predator infestation all over the place. So I'm sympathetic to them. But the question is, and I don't know whether Anne or anybody else can answer it, is do we actually need Southern Lake Sanctuary? Um, surely what the central government is doing in terms of establishing predator-free New Zealand 2050, if I've got the right target date, that I might not have, um, but there, there is a major project underway through central government to remove predators from our landscape full stop. 
why then should we invest our ratepayers' money in localised projects um, which might or might not succeed? I think that this paper, uh, thoroughly comprehensive again, uh, well done by Gavin and team and Anna, uh, doesn't take us anywhere really, because there's not even a suggestion of a, of a way forward that comes out of it, except that it does remind us that we have uh, a system which meets PIM's requirement to be strategic, and that is the ECOFUND. Now, it's a drop in the bucket compared with the kind of money that's being consumed by the PFD and would probably be consumed by Southern Lake Sanctuary. But at least it's got the framework, it's got the priorities, it's got the assessment methods, it's got a track record, it's got public acceptance, and the people know about it now because it's been going for quite a few years and going very successfully. So if it's, in my mind, if we are going to go anywhere with this, we bring, bring everything back to the strategic framework of the Eco Fund, and if we're of a mind and if our ratepayers can afford it, we put more money in there for a number of specific projects which have an Otago orientation. Uh, and people have to simply live with the amount of money we can put in there in terms of us being contributors. So this is the way forward I see out of this paper, is to focus on the EcoFund approach, its priorities set by our long-term plan and our biosecurity strategy, um, and that's it. We don't then come under pressure from all those projects in paragraph 53, uh, asking with various degrees of persuasiveness for one-off cash handouts from a council, which is no longer cash rich. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Michael. I think there's some really good thinking in there, going back to the eco fund and if, if necessarily, necessary, looking at the potential funding of that. I mean, for, for example, we have a huge asset in the, in, in the port that, yes, pays a dividend, but is that the best way to actually utilise that? Anyway, these are all thinkings. Kevin? Yeah, and, and it is a, a thinking paper, but I just, uh, and Councillor Decker meant that predator-free New Zealand 2050, we've also got the wild and fine government, we've got the exemplar cash minutes, we've got the jobs for nature, they're all environmental improvement initiatives from government um, and a lot of them are coming and just looking at the exemplar group up in the Manihiri Care which has only I think got three years to go and there's other ones dropping off all the time and in reality they're not going to drop the ball on that, in reality they will need to refund and refocus, they'll change the focus, it won't be called jobs for nature, it'll be jobs for the environment or whatever and government will have to refocus a lot of that. But what, what we need to continue doing is exactly what we've, in my opinion, is exactly what we've done with our shovel ready, ready stuff, is when these funds are available, be ready to pounce on them and have a very good track record, which we're showing with our shovel ready, to be able to, say, send that money down to a target. They look after the money that they do the job well. So it's, so I think in that, in that space, I think that's going to be our strongest initiative. Happy with the ECHO Fund? And pushing that along, and you know, long term we might see, uh, but again, that's straight out rate payer money, uh, unless we do use a dividend, which has got a bit of mid thought to it. But that is again still straight, rate payers money. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Wait on, let me finish. Let me finish. Well, yes, yeah. Yeah, but but it, it's oh, you can't, no, don't get into that. But, but the reality, the reality is, we've got it. Government, it's election year ne next year. Uh, and they're moving, at, no matter what government's in, we're moving on this environmental chain, and we've just got to make sure that we're, we're focused and ready to jump on that at each time. Shovel Ready is a perfect example. There's a lot of regional councils around and organisations that put in the Shovel Ready money and have, have, have not fronted. So we've got, we've got some big picks, and we just need to keep those going, really. Cool. Thank you, Kevin. Michael Laws. Um, I think before we start even thinking, Perfect. Well done, Liz. <laughs> Systems do work after all. Um, <laughs> Where's Paul Michael gone? Um, okay. What happened to Michael? He's only half gone, it's okay. <laughs> Went bad, unfortunately. Okay, so um, 
while Michael's maybe coming back, I, a final point I'd like, a question I'd like to ask is, this is a note and report, but, or, or even to Pim, um, how, how do we avoid this report and this discussion sitting on the shelf as opposed to going somewhere? When are we going to build upon these discussions um, as opposed to being reactive when we receive some type of application? Uh, well, I, I think we need to spend a bit more time doing strategic uh, thinking and strategic planning. I've, I think, um, Amanda, we've got a session planned, haven't we? Uh, but we're going to do some more strategy sessions. It's really down to the council, ultimately. We'll do what you want us to. But my view would be uh, it would be good to, to, to focus a little more on strategic topics. Okay. Cool. Is there any other discussion, Michael, or is it not Andrew? Well, I just very briefly... Uh, at the beginning of the last term, I mean, we had a strategic planning session up at the Eco Sanctuary, and that was, I think, facilitated by Peter Lingus. And we talked about regional parks and large scale uh, biodiversity, biosecurity restoration projects, and, and that sort of thing. But because there was so much coming down the pipeline in terms of shovel ready jobs for nature, et cetera, et cetera, I think that's where our focus uh, was. And uh, so I think it'll be timely whoever's around the table after the election is to sort of just take a stock take where we're at and where we want to head uh, in a strategic sense on those, uh, particularly on those larger projects, because often those larger projects attract a significant amount of funding via you know, partnerships, et cetera, and uh, the Southern Lake Sanctuary is probably a good example of that. Where, um, they can uplift the considerable amount of funding themselves, providing they can find um, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, we're going to move that. Second, uh, um, no further Very discussion. Good. I'll put the motion, those four. Aye. 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 Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Libby. Thank you, Gavin. Brian, I'm sorry, but what did we just decided? I, I couldn't understand what you're saying. To note the report. We're, we're noting. Is, it, is that all? Just, just noting. But, but, you know, Pim has pointed out that. You know, the, the staff are available to continue this strategic yeah. discussion and, and <clears throat> realising it's important. Personally, I took um, a lot of merit in what you said about building on the Eco Fund. So anyway, it, it's not lost. Okay, that's fine. But uh, yeah, it's a pity we couldn't go gone one step further. But never mind, it was a good discussion. Cool. Thank you. Um, right. Biosecurity operational plan. Um, yeah, the biosecurity operational plan uh, for 2021-22 summary of performance. Author Libby Corbin, Murray Baldwin, welcome again. Endorsed by Gavin. And the report is the implementation for the, yeah, the period that I have just said. Uh, I will note a couple of points, if I may. The first one is just reminding us that this oper operational plan enacts the regional Pest management plan and provides additional detail explaining how the objectives of it will be met through specific deliverables, that is, actions, performance measures, and targets. I also point out that we've had some significant steps forward. You'll see in paragraph three that overall 53 KPIs were fully achieved or exceeded. And if you compare that with last year's achievement, where it was only 20. So um, I'm sure Libby might want to talk about that. And finally, also say that work has also progressed to improve administration actions, a new system that links inspections and administration being rolled out in October 2022, which is not far away. The new system is expected to simplify and speed up the administration of biosecurity compliance. So Libby, thank you for all the work that's been given that's gone on. Um, any comments in relation to this report? No, we'll take it as read. Happy to answer questions. Okay, um, cool. I'll open it up. There's a lot in there. You want to ask about rocks? Hillary. Um, yes, but I was happy to go into the rabbits that I'm sure were. It's, I, I see this in here. I hadn't seen it. I just heard it on the radio and I thought, oh, didn't know we're up to doing those. And obviously, since there weren't any, we were, that was the good thing, that we weren't sort of doing anything with them, because there wasn't any. Well, it, it says here on page 51 of 115 that there were four sightings reported, but none confirmed. Yes. One sighting was reported through a non-standard methane inspection. They've been mapped on the GIS system. Cool. Yes. 
And so we're hoping that the wallabies will end up like the rocks. Cool. Sounds good. Any other questions or discussion? Um, have I got any hands? Yeah, soon. Kate? So if a group did want to set up a site-led project, it doesn't have to be in the regional land transport. Oh, regional uh, pest management, pest management plan. plan does it. I, can't, I mean, that, while you've got examples in there on the peninsula and everything else, a group that came together and wanted to do this could contact you and fabulous. And that's what's happening in the Catlins. Up to way. Can you tell us what is happening? Because I think that's. Um, I mean, I, I haven't heard anything back since, since I went to the meeting, so I don't know what's happening. So, so if, um, you'll know as much as me then, because that's right. where, where it's got to so far. We've got membership on the on the working group, so right. through one of our staff and through you. I think you're in the working group as well. Is that oh, right? Yeah, that's why I haven't heard anything for months. Okay. So, so that's, yeah. I, so I, I thought I was. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> I, I believe you are. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. At the moment, anyway. Um, I've got no hands in there. We don't have to sit on this report. Um, but any anything in particular, like this? I mean, it's an admin operational report, Hillary. Um, knowing what we now know about rabbits. Yeah. Um, what page is that on? Can anybody remember? And KPIs. Perhaps we, if we started with KPIs, I see we're doing a lot better with KPIs than last year. And the slight undertone of that would be, thank God, because last year was last time was sort of a wee bit unhappy and doubtless because of the world being an unhappy place. Um, are we, Why are we doing better than last year? Um, so through the chair, we have increased our resource in the yeah. biosecurity space. Yeah. And we've also, um, I guess the last year's operational plan was one of the first that we've created. So yeah. we've developed our, we've progressed our KPIs so that they're not um, always as unachievable as we'd originally planned for nice. as well. So um, they can't be, they're not a direct comparison is what I'm trying to say, because some of them have changed to be different to what we had in the past, but we have upped our resource in the biosecurity space. We've improved our systems and processes so that it makes our job easier to be out in the field and to have leaders going out faster and all those kind of admin, uh, the admin stuff's being streamlined. Um, it will be even more streamlined in October, we're hopeful, when we've got this um, new system yeah. up and running as well. Um, and we just continue to improve our, our work as we go. Okay. So, Apologies, yes, Hillary. So the question is, um, are we, as we speak, sort of developing a set of KPIs that are slightly aspirational, <laughs> um, but potentially achievable compared with, I mean, like the lupins, do we, do we change developing it to say, this just wasn't, we thought it was gonna be a good measure, but it just turned out not to be a good measure. And some of them we really should be working on because we, we haven't achieved them be, and we should be and other ones that we could never achieve. You know, sort of, you know, are we trying to develop them so as they just, just are worth having a real go at it? If I can answer that, yes, they need to be stretched targets, but we're also going to be yeah. realistic. And so the operational plan that we're implementing now, uh, which will be the third plan, I think it's it is. Yeah, plan. that's certainly, again, a big improvement. So you'll see when in a year's time, when we come back with some of the reports on the current plan, um, it, it'll, you know, that'll be much better again. Um, but we do need, to, do need to settle on some targets, which, which we've got to, so we get that longitudinal comparability as well. That's very important as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, we're, we're pretty happy with the operational plan in the current year, but this is a bit of a legacy. Yeah. So thank you for that, because it sounds yeah. like there's some good work. Thank you, Hilary. If there's no further discussion, I've got to move it from Kate. I, I Second that. And I've got Carmen seconded. I will ask the question though, the third recommendation which says the Greece report and the attached operational plan be provided to the Minister for Biosecurity. Mm. We also have seen the implementation plan, like it seems to me the implementation has got a lot more, you know, like it's showing what the outcomes that we're achieving as opposed to just the operational processes. Do we just send one? Is this what all they're interested in? 
Uh, we do two things. We see in the operational plan, which is what we intend delivering, yes. in a, and, and we've done that recently for the yeah. one that council approved a yeah. month or two ago. And then what we do is we send um, this report, and it's the attachment to this report, which is really the yeah. Um, the critical bit, and we send this to the minister. No, that's fine. Okay, we've got to move on in a second. I'll put. I'm just deleting the brackets around 1993, and the first recommendation. That's it's a pedant for the thing. I, 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 I won't get involved. Get that, Kate. No, Thank you very much. Michael, anyway, I'm, going to, I'm going to put the motion. Those four. I against carried. Right. Thank, Thank you, Olivia right. and Gavin. Um, we're going to now move to, I think we must be on 7.4, River Management Update. Um, and so I'm going to invite Michelle, hopefully she's on Zoom, and Pam. She's here. Yeah. Wow. Um, While well, Michelle's coming to the front, um, I will just say the remind the purpose to provide a quarterly summary of river management operation activities, including gravel extraction and sense development of work programs, asset management plans for planting along riverbanks, and initial assessment of damage arising from the recent floods is presented. So, cool. So, I've got Michelle, and have I got Pam as well? Welcome. Thank you for being here. So, River Management. Okay. <laughs> well, my my mentoring is not going well. Um, Delegation. What you're settling in, does either of you want to make any comments about the report? About your update? Um, I've been caught off guard. Hello. Hello. Um, through the chair. Um, thank you. Um, We'll take the report as read. Yeah. Um, would we like to add anything? No, I think. Um, Pretty comprehensive. Yes, I just wanted to highlight, um, as I did in the briefing, there's there's probably two matters that we would like to bring to council's attention, which is the um, flood repair damage, which we, we've touched on. And also, um, we wanted to also just touch on, because it has been raised in previous councils, our relationship with the FMU boundaries. Yeah. And we wanted to really just touch on how we've aligned the river management, I guess, work 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 streams to, to have a touch point with the FMU boundaries, which I think is really what this year about is going to be about, is really sort of starting to do that catchment approach thinking. Um, cool. So the FMUs and then also the, the recent flood works. And I'm just trying to remember that were there some budgetary challenges for the, the recent floods? Yes, there is there is, and, and just highlighting that this is a very provisional number at the moment of, of around two and a half million dollars of, of unbudgeted damage. Um, that number will change as we get more information, but we're just revealing to you what we know at the moment, and it's subject to refinement as we work through fuller investigations and determining what needs to be done and the sequencing of it. So we're just telling you what we know at the minute, but it's a very, very preliminary number and flagging a financial um, issue that we have. And, and you would then seek that funding over time through the, the, the rating groups? Well, the intention is to come back to um, council as soon as practicable with the repair program as we've done yes. in the previous floods yes. Yes. and describe uh, what we intend doing about and how much it will cost and then how it, would, how it would be funded. So those are all things to work through in the fullness of time. Well, thank you. I'm going to open it up. Any hands in the air? Hillary, apologies. Two questions. Proudest of and biggest challenge? Sorry, Councillor Calvert, could you repeat that? <laughs> What are you proudest of that you've been doing this report and what has been your biggest challenge? Um, thank you, Councillor Calvert. Um, through the chair, I'd like um, to hand the proudest of to our team leader, Pam. I'd like to have her um, comment on that. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> You took so, seat. <laughs> there are many things I'm proud of, but I think the, the fact that we've even put this report in front of you with the level of detail that it has in it, the amount of work that goes into 
um, preparing our programs and being able to monitor our programs and then report to them and show that transparency is absolutely huge. And from the beginning of this, um, or the last financial year, in fact, the beginning of last calendar year, right through till now, it is absolutely massive, the amount of work that has gone into it. And it is an incredible team. It really, really is. They know what they're doing. So our aim is to continue to show that and build off that. That's a great, I think, a great foundation. Cool. Thank you, like thank you, Pam. So that's what allows our rate players to be really pleased that they are their money is being spent wisely and that you can explain why and you can explain why you're doing the next bit. So that's a really important thing for us. So thank you. Thank you. And the second part of that question, what, what has been our greatest challenge, I think um, expanding what Pam has said is really moving our, our engineering function and certainly the river management function into um, a space where we are moving out of a subjective work program into a longer catchment term thinking um, and also bringing into Manatawai and really in, ingraining that in our culture with our with our staff um, oh. and, and leveraging those relationships so sounds great thank you I've, I've, I've got uh, Gary and then Carmen and then Kate Gary thank you I'm um, going put question with me here here uh, we have done some work at OFA and with the recent flood that we just had. I think the landowner had done some work with, with the lists prior to that. We did some work. How did it fear through the, that recent flood? Uh, through the chair. Are you referring to um, the Leask Bend area or? Yeah, that's fed very well. Um, in fact, the vegetation solution part of that was um, excellent. And um, I think that particular area, um, it was um, an example where um, the mitigation and the works carried out along that river bank actually reduced that overtopping that, that then cut off the roads into Ofa. So that's been really successful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then not quite so successful is down at the Ocacow um, surge outfall ponds. And um, I mean, there's sort of varying comment around the fences around the ponds themselves and how they, in some ways, protect the pond, and then in other ways, um, not to be quite a trap. So we've obviously got issues that need to be rectified there. Um, through the chair, with, with the Omacau sewerage ponds, um, we weren't sort of directly involved with any of the discussions around that area, and I think CODC are very... Um, proactive in that space. Um, it, it's a complex area, actually. There's quite a few tributaries and creeks that come across across that area. And I think a lot of overland flooding before the Menuharikia even actually um, activates. So, yeah, but, but um, we've been proactive in supporting CODC and certainly looking at any ways, you know, um, that river management um, may have a touch point with them. Are you suggesting, Gary, that the fence was maybe some type of hazard that, you know, that it actually, you know, no different than uh, wall valves or type of thing? Or it was, it's a big chain link fence. Yeah. And it was around the top mm -hmm. of, the, of the bench. Yeah. And the flood was on a scale that, you know, the pond liner blew out. Yeah. But, you know, in some cases it was possibly affected, but in other cases, yeah. It wasn't a very comment being made. And, a lot of people are commenting about it, but it's a big issue. Yeah, big issue, but you're saying that's CODC's responsibility? Primarily, yes. Would yeah. you say through the chair, uh, my understanding the regulatory, as it is and co, uh, dealing with the, um, the regulatory matter yeah. with CODC? You know, I think at CODC have got a business case in train looking at practices right. of long term, uh, yes. that location is suitable. Okay, and also I think the other side as well. So oh, it's all the pull and play that's being quite proactive about that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sewage bond floodplain done that up, so they're probably going to need to fix it. Oh, hey, thanks for that, Andrew. It's, it's good to know that. So thanks, Gary, Carmen, and then Kate. Thank you, um, Chair. I was just asking that question before, and I thought I was a little bit early, but it was asking you, Ms. Mifflin, about. The fact that you've 
obviously very well and been on time with a lot of this funding work. And I guess I was sort of thinking about the moderating part of it, if you like, where you're given the money, if you like, you're spending it. And I was wondering how you have fared perhaps in terms of other councils if you've done the comparison or has it put you in a good light, if if I can use that word, where if you want to come back and apply for more funding, that the um, incredible work you've done is advantageous? You know, is, is that a good thing? I'm, I'm picking it is, but I just would like to tease it out a bit more, please. Through the chair. Thank, thank you, Councillor Hope. That's a brilliant question, but may I reserve it for the next paper? Cool. Oh, I am really up today, aren't I? Sorry, everybody. No, no, it's, all good. it's all good. Thanks, Carmen. We'll talk about the next. Uh, Kate? Uh, two, uh, I've got a few more questions, and one is really particular. The, the figure one, the map of uh, the boundaries of Leaping News. I just want to check that. Is there an issue with the boundary of Otago and Southland? And I'm not trying to be clever. Um, the Clutha, um, the lower Clutha, the bottom bit of Southland on it. And I'm just just checking whether that actually is the case because I mean it's an interesting thing when it comes to the RPS. And uh, certainly we've got some interesting issues around that. And I just I hadn't read understood we come back to me on that later if you like. I just uh, it is an interesting one. Um the uh one the paragraph 21 may be a typo, but I just want to check this and I want to understand who the stakeholders are that we've been working with. There's a type of 23rd of September, which I don't think we've got to yet. I could, I'm oh, sorry, Carmen may have actually, at the rate she's going. Yeah. <laughs> it's environmental management plan. Sorry, I'm just looking at the paragraph. So what paragraph are we on? 21. 21. Page um, 70. So it was circulated to stakeholders on the 23rd. No, that hasn't happened yet. So through through the chair. Uh, yes, I'd like to apologise. That is a typo. That was meant to be August. Okay. Um, the stakeholders are Okaha, uh, Fishing Game, Dock, and um, that's it. Um, sorry. Sorry. Um, Yes, that's it, I think, yeah. And this is an area that some communities have been really interested in, and I'm just wondering why some of those groups are not, are not considered, or even the gravel extraction industries who could be using this gravel if it were taken out for non-commercial purposes, why they aren't in that mix, or is that not seen as an affected party? I, I um, to, or, is it, or is this a regulatory... Yeah. framework that these ones have to be consulted with. Yes, so two parts to it. I think um, when we've been renewing this global consent, it's been following a regulatory path of being non-notified. So it goes to these stakeholders mm -hmm. which are set out. Um, the second part of that question around um, non-commercial, um, you know, stakeholders that may be interested in, in gravel use. I think that sort of falls into our management operational okay. plan of it and that kind of communication um, through our river management plans. Okay. Um, the next question is on the asset management plans and I'm loving the fact that you're doing work on the plantings. I know that they're issues that I've raised and uh, congratulations. I'm just wondering if the AMIS or um, asset management- So what paragraph is it? Sorry, 31, it's a heading on page 71 of 115. Sorry, 31 onwards. Um, is that database going to be public? At some stage, not necessarily now. I appreciate while you're still developing it. So through the chair, the plan is to be able to share more statistics with you as we start collecting data. Mm -hmm. So that will certainly be public. Um, we haven't really given, we're, we're not at the stage yet where we're considering the potential future audiences for that, but it's not off the table. It's just considering what information is relevant and where. Okay. And I mean, I just know that there's people who don't know trees that they look like they're on their property, but they don't know if they're allowed to cut them down or not. And if they're your assets, they can't. And it's just that delineation that people want to understand. Um, and I don't, I think I, I, I think I missed it. I don't think it's in here. The idea, and it's in one of the later papers tomorrow about liaison groups or um, catchment groups 
having an idea of action plans in your gravel management or river management, is that that catchment sort of thing you're talking about? Do you see there being some tie up there once catchment groups are formed? Through the chair, I, I think I'll in, attempt to answer this in a few steps. Um, yes, there would be, certainly. Um, once, once we've actually got our new global consent and our environmental management plan up and running and, and we've developed our operational plans under that, um, I'll, I'll you know, do, you, do you correct me if I'm off track. Um, we, we, we would expect that, um, you know, the, the gravel management strategy would be socialised um, to communities and, and certainly internally we, we expect to be working on a catchment scale through, through internal communication processes, absolutely. Um, and there was a second part to your question, I forgot. Um, no, sort of that's it? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, okay. cool. Okay, I don't see any hands on Zoom. I don't see any hands on the table. I'm going to move to, sorry, Yeah. Yeah, no idea. I've just been waiting for takers asking the same question. Well, we have got another. Um, can I ask a question while you're doing this? Yes, do go. Yep. Um, my, mine's in relation to the recommendation. Um, the third recommendation. Um, sorry about this. Uh, here we go here. Notes of preliminary scope and estimate of cost of repairs resulting from the July August 2022 flood. And then I'm I'm just Whereabouts in the report does it say the two and a half million? I see on paragraph 48 it says the premium estimates from limiting the other management issues are more than 400,000 or more, and with some damage to the front fight. And then the next it talks about preliminary estimates of flood protection and claim schemes, namely the lower. Yeah, cliff. please, Mr. Chair. It's um, it should be 1.9 million. It's paragraph 49. Yeah, I was working with an earlier figure. No, that's that's cool. So it's, that's that figure, but it, and it's an estimate. It's, it's preliminary. Plus, plus that's 400. Fine. That just clarifies yeah. there. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, look, there was a huge river floods up in the uh, in mid Canterbury, and Ashburton River caused a whole heap of grief, and uh, they they can, along with all the associated people around, have have realised and in consultation realised that once you put a bridge in a river, um, you cannot necessarily allow the river to, to move where it wants to move and behave with the way a river wants to behave. So they've actually got a group together now and uh, there are groups from North Otago that have been taken up to help them work out a management plan around extracting gravel and taking the appropriate amounts of gravel out of the system to ensure that those that infrastructure is protected. So I assume that in our environmental management plan, that sort of activity will be catered for in our, in our consent. If not, I want to know why. But also just adding to that, you have on, on number 46 in the Waitaki area, the majority of damage has occurred on the Kakanui River, where the river is broken out, its usual bed, and where Gravel accumulation is impacting on river behaviour and accelerating erosion of riverbank in concentrated locations. Now, we have been, uh, since probably my second month on council, we have talk, been talking about getting gravel removed from around the Cowra Bridge and other parts of the Kakanui River uh, to ensure that that damage doesn't occur. So I'm just wondering what level I just think this paper is awesome, but I, I'm just wondering what what damage would have to be done uh, to get the ORC to actually do something about the Cowra and the Kakanui River, because this is actually dragging on. Uh, I'm going to be back uh, in the next triennium, so I'll probably <laughs> have had long, long enough of it, of it dragging on, because it's a simple fix. We've, had, we've got a management plan. Uh, we've got contractors up there with a management plan for the river that would cost the council nothing, um, and I understand why that hasn't been taken up, but I mean, this is, yeah. No, why point, is it not point, happening? Point well made. Is, is there any response to that? Because I suspect this is an area of frustration for more than one community sometimes. We, we're just, can I pass that back? Okay, I can start that through the chair. Um, for as long as I've been at ORC, which is three and a half years, I've also heard about gravel and gravel management. Um, we don't have an overall Otago gravel management strategy. Um, 
ORC Engineering have never had remit under its consents to extract gravel. Um, the gravel that the gravel extraction that we are including in our global consent is for flood and hazard mitigation only. Um, to extract gravel, it requires, um, and you refer to management plan, it requires more than just a management plan. It has to consider all effects, all environmental effects. It has to have spatial awareness of the areas um, and have significant information about our rivers, which are cross sections, bed levels, and things like that. Um, so we have been doing um, an utterly demonstrous amount of work to do the first iterative step to get us to be able to address hazard mitigation in our rivers around gravel aggradation. Now, there's a reason why we have a consent that is only for five years is because we're expecting regional plans and probably the way the future will look like, how our gravel management, um, and I've referred to ECAN numerous times before, that we would most likely move into that type of modelling with gravel management. But as a team that has river management in their, their remit, we need to I can only take the step changes and direct the strategy around those step changes of addressing those areas. Removing gravel is actually not a great thing for the river. What is also not a great thing for river is the infrastructure and the things that we put in the river that in, in, intersect these natural processes. So I guess um, where we need to go over the, the next um, two years of our long-term plan is starting to put in place a sensible framework on how we're approaching these areas that are hazard mitigation, gravel aggradation areas. I know that sounds a bit wordy, but um, we then need to develop what is our ORC gravel management strategy across Otago. And, um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, um, but we need to just um, move in a sensible step forward and framework around that. And I can only do that um, through the mechanism um, of our global consent that, that I guess allows us to, um, if we need to address areas of significant aggradation, ag ag um, then we will actually um, explore having a separate consent. Now, commercial, other contractors that are currently holding um, um, consents to extract gravel for commercial purposes or otherwise, um, they also have their own consent conditions, which they have to apply, all right? So we're not privy to that. Um, and where we can build a relationship and leverage those um, um, consents or commercial operators in place appropriately, um, we will. So when, when will the, commu the Kakanoo community know where they stand in relation to the gravel situation on their river near their bridge? Is that the question you're asking? On the Carroll Bridge, yeah. So when, when roughly you're saying there's work to be done, do we know those dates, like around the region that we identified the critical points? We currently don't have, unless we pursue a separate consent, the ability to extract gravel. Um, we are aware of the issues in the power, um, and what we're looking to do through this year is to look at the, the planning and the timing of what, what that area of hazard mitigation for gravel extraction looks like. No, I, can't, I cannot give a date or a time. So, so uh, you're saying it's re around a hazard, so you can, can, can you currently go in to remove a hazard? Gravel related? Yeah. No, we don't have an extraction consent. A extraction to remove gravel. So we just let the bridge until we, I'm not, I'm not saying you're not doing it quick enough, well, yeah, but, but clearly, if this bridge is threatened again, I mean, we're lucky probably in this last flood, we're lucky in this last flood that it was a slow flood. Uh, so, and that, that gravel in, uh, probably in the three years would have gone up uh, at least half a metre increased. And yeah, so that, things are happening. But so the, uh, if a major flood, a, a fast flood came down there, uh, because of the pole up that was at that bridge, we're probably going to lose the bridge. So, so we, there's no way we can go in there and fix that. At the moment, it's not. The, 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 I just can't. I, I find that. I just find that um, I'm really struggling that at the moment that I can't get in there with a digger and take up a pole because we've created it. Uh, look, take, you, you say taking, I'm not disagreeing. You're taking grab out of a river may not be any good, but the fact is, we humans are here, 
and, mm. and we put you know, so it's scaring out land. If, if there was houses, if, if this was a river coming into South Dunedin and scaring out where houses were, everyone would be up in arms. Right, but it's it's scaring out valuable land. Well, it's scaring out land, whether it be valuable or not. It's threatening infrastructure, so um, so no one can cut through that and get the job fixed. I just I find that absolutely. Yeah, that, that's the sort of stuff. Um, yeah, but I just wonder. I'm struggling. If, I'm struggling with it really. I just wonder if we just go away and we just look at. Um, I mean, well, I'm not close enough with close enough to the mechanisms in terms of who else holds consents and, and that kind of thing at that location. But I think staff, we just go away and look at what can be done ahead of us getting our own own consent and then reporting back, yeah. looking because at what the, can be done. So the part that confuses me is that we had commercial consents for gravel extraction. So in the past, we've, we've done this type of thing, but we don't seem to be nimble enough to put it in the necessary places. Or if, if we've got a situation, do we... What's the future look like? Do we, is there no more commercial extraction consents? But through the chair, I no, I haven't said that. Yeah. You, 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 there's there's as many commercial consents. You have got to remember, we're an operational leg of ORC, so I don't have privy to the commercial consents that are available. No, but what I'm my so, point is that, that they are extracting gravel, right? Yes, um, and they and here's a situation where potentially there's some gravel to be. Ex for yeah, but, but those commercial consent holders will have conditions around their gravel extraction. Now, I just want to point out something else in the Cowra area. We have, we, we are aware of that area and WD, uh, Waitaki District Council also have a part to play in this as well, okay? Um, but in this particular area, there is some very sensitive dock um, requirements in this part of the river, right? So what we need to address is um, outside of the renewal of our global consent processes, is there a case for looking at, um, you know, a consent of its own or do we have um, commercial operators that have conditions that can appropriately assist with that? You know, th these are things I've got to look at. Okay, but I can't answer them here. Okay, no, that's fine. I, 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 I just said your report's superb. Look, I'm not, I'm not, I, but I'm just saying that. Yeah, but I'm hearing an issue. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, through yeah. through the chair, I'm hearing an issue that yeah. sounds to me like, um, you know, there, there's a significant piece of infrastructure in 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 a weather event that's going to go. That's not yeah. my understanding. Yeah. Um, well, that's not what the locals are saying. Okay. That understand the river. Um, yeah. Anyway, there, okay. there's been an undertaking to come back and, and maybe even across the board as a general sort of statement how all these issues are approached. And thank you. And, and I also acknowledge yeah. Yeah. your comment in terms of Tamana Otawai and the, and the need to treasure the river as well. So I'm not trying to um, undermine that. I, 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 I'm thankful for that. Thank you. I've got some names down here. I've got Carmen and then Hillary. Take me off, please. I've been done. Ben and done. You've been thank and you. done. So I'm. Now, Hillary, was this on this matter? Yes. Oh, if you, and, and then followed by Carmen. And possibly Gary's is on this. Um, nice. Have you got your I, I understood you to say, but I might have misheard that you're not, you haven't got access to the consent conditions of commercial operators. I would have thought they were legoimerable. They were a matter of shot at work. I, I mean, I can understand how you, Personally, haven't at the moment got them, but I don't understand how you couldn't just email along the corridor and get a list of them. Or is that uh, through, through the chair? Um, <laughs> it's it's not usual for me to or our team to ask for a list of all the commercial consents and well, conditions. Yeah. But but I ask it for you if you. No. It, it, it is available and I would go through the appropriate processes um, with my regulatory colleagues if we needed to do that. Um, but, you know, I haven't had a, a requirement for that as such yet. Yes. So they that. would be, there's no issue with them being available. And, this, uh, and it, it seems to me important if we're considering that we might want to get or, or apply to Richard for an another one or whatever we need to do, that we know everything about what currently people have, both us and commercial operators. So yeah, no, yeah, and, and, and yeah. that's right. And Michelle intimated that before. That so, be looking yeah. at so the commitment is that we will look into 
um, how we might use any existing commercial consent at this locality to expedite gravel removal. We will cool. do that. And I think um, Ms. Mifflin was referring to didn't have the conditions at hand. It's clearly accessible. Yeah. It's public yes, information. You know, yeah. it'll be there. That's why I'm saying I wasn't oh, yeah, sure no that. problem looking yeah. at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool, cool. Carmen, is, is this on, um, is your question on this topic? <laughs> on the next paper. <laughs> Morris. Okay, Gary's on this one. <laughs> just, well, it was just to add to this that um, back in my previous term, we were taken to that site that Councillor Malcolm yeah. raised. The landowners and contractors there raised the concern then about how worried they were about the river, what was happening to it. It was breaking out into farmland as it was, and it was going to keep getting worse. And I think the situation is um, emulated across other sites across Otago. Mm. Uh, it is going to be an ongoing issue. And I, I would suggest that for the new coming council, uh, it's something that needs to be considered urgent. Cool, oh, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm just going to ask Carmen again. Are you there, Carmen? If not, I, I think we're done in, in relation. Brian, I am here. Okay. Did you have Bron a question? Yes, yeah, sorry. Just, just, uh, it was good. Thank you. It worked out well because, um, and I concur with just Councillor Callagher too. Um, Ms Mifflin and, and Councillor Wilson may have raised it, but we, we had anxious people too at Clutha, I must admit to you at Bill Clutha, asking us about the gravel extraction and the river there. Um, so that has come up, you know, quite often when I've been there too. So, um, and to be fair with you, I didn't really have an answer because I wasn't sure and I said I would go back and find out. So um, there's many parts of that, I think, in, in Otago that are, asking those sorts of questions about it. So uh, may I, the Chair, ask that question that I got a wee bit uh, mulled up for with the, the timing. Can I ask that now? Would that be all right to ask that, Councillor no, Scott? We're going to the next one. Yeah, oh, right. Oh, God, OK, yep. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. I, I know you've moved the river management. Thank you I'll very much. We've got a second. We're going to move in a second. I'll put the motion. Thanks for that. There's three recommendations. Uh, those four. Aye. 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 Against carried. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Panem. Thank you, again. Thank you. Right. And we've got another uh, final report. <coughs> just figure out how to get their climate resilience program update uh, by Michelle and by Brett Patterson. Here's Brett. Welcome, Brett. Um, the report, the purpose of the report to provide an update on the program for Otago Regional Council Climate Resilience Program, which comprises four flood protection projects. That is one, the West Barry Contour Channel and Bridge Upgrade. Two, the upgrade information for flood management structures at the Robson and the Thurn and Lake Two at the Toto. Um, Riverbank, Flood Bank Stabilisation Works, which I think is close by in the outcome flood protection. Um, I'm going to invite somebody from the front desk to comment on their report if they wish. Through Michelle the, or Brett or Gavin. Through the chair, um, we'd also like to take this um, report as read. Um, we thought it would be timely um, during this council term to, to, to bring to you an update on, on the Climate Resilience Program. Um, it has been um, a lot of work going into this <laughs> and uh, so um, I hope that this is actually giving you um, at least a bit of a snapshot of where we are. I'm going to hand it over to, to Brett for questions. And... Oh, questions? You got anything you want to say at this point? No. I know that um, Gavin has, has previously said that he, he was very pleased with um, the initial proposals and the fact that we we're able to deliver on those proposals. And I think other councils have acknowledged that at this table. So thank you for that. Um, questions? Carmen, I think, is first. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, sorry. Look, I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed about this. Um, gosh, then we've lost that. Right, I think I've, I can, can pick up where I was. I was just wanting to ask you, thank you, and if this is the right place, please be with me, that we have done some very good work, and I was just wanting to know along the way, I guess you are, you know, moderated for for what you've what your uh, application is, and then the money you've received, and then there's the finishing. And then what I wanted to ask you was, how does that set you in a good light for another project? Should it come up, 
um, because you know you've, you've perhaps come on time um, on budget and then the second part to that is have other regional councils been as fortunate as what we have been um, with with perhaps projects I've applied for and perhaps money they've got and, and um, the outcomes please through the chair, I, I will start this question and then invite Brett to, to also comment. On the first part of your question, Councillor Hope, um, have we been moderated along the way? Uh, we, we have, in a way, with our, the other regional councils that we report through to um, board, which is made up of the, the river sector in Kanoa, um, and Otago Regional Council has been... Um, really well placed nationally in terms of our performance and delivery. Um, and a lot of that has really been around um, some critical thinking and decisioning when I was in lockdown, <laughs> consulting with Gavin and um, making sure that we did indeed have as close possible uh, shovel ready projects and that um, we could resource them and um, deliver them. So, we, we have done well on that front and other regional councils have also been um, doing well on that front as well. In terms of, does it set us in good light for additional funding? Um, yes, it does. <laughs> and um, I'd like to hand over to Brett for his, his view and comment on that as well. Um, yep, so I think in terms of um, you know, performance, our, our track record is certainly be important when we're looking to future um, funding applications, so how they'll be viewed by the likes of the ministry. So, um, yes, it is important to perform well, and I think, yes, it does provide future opportunity for further funding. Cool. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, really good projects, and I'm uh, really excited by the Robson Lagoon. And nice to talk to someone from Kaitanga the other day, really impressed with it. Um, it's just the stage is so far, so it's great. I've just got a couple of questions around the um, and sorry, and I know that you um, we did some interactions during the week, some concerns about the lower clothes, and it's great to have a work program ahead for that, though, answering those people who are asking about that. The Outram project and the Contour Channel project, and if I look at um, um, the, the Outram project is looking at coming in under budget, I think quite substantially. Um, how is that being paid, the ORC contribution? Because I'm just trying to work out it's right down below out from this um, things. It's not benefiting out from necessarily, or is it? Um, but it seemed a big project. I mean, is it a big project for the risk? I suppose a flood bank is a flood bank and it has to be contained. Yes, so in terms of is it um, benefiting out from directly? Mm. So that the, um, the, the point in doing the project is to maintain the stability of the stock bank in that area. So, mm. and you know, look to prevent a, a failure during a large flood event or something like that. So from that perspective, yes, it has been a fitting out. Yeah, we call it out, but it's actually the, the whole, the integrity of the whole lower drainage yeah. scheme as opposed to out from itself. That's integrity. Yeah, it, it does extend, you know, to the yeah. Yeah. airport. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, well, no, it doesn't. And that, well, that, that's the other question. Is, mm -hmm. it, is it that area that, so it's the tire that floods the airport or the contour channel or both? Both. So just okay. to be clear, we've yeah. called it Outram Flood Protection Project because it's, it's in the vicinity of Outram. Mm. But this is pro this would be arguably our most critical mm. location anywhere in 200 kilometres of flood banks that we own because a failure at this location potentially inundates um, new housing. You know, well, yeah, new housing mm. and, and all the West Tyree, including the airport, the Needham Airport, mm. much of. Um, the western part of that area is at or below current mean sea level um, and it would happen catastrophically it would be a very sudden failure at the worst possible time okay and so um, that's why this project is so important to us okay and it, it probably doesn't come out from the map and just that's that's good to I'm let us question I'm much better informed now the contour channel in that work and I've been down to the side and I think some others may have been there's some real um, interest in getting some gravel taken out, just because we're talking about gravel extraction, um, and uh, and getting a more even channel there for the drainage. Now that isn't, I think, a water river or a waterway. I'm just checking on: will you be doing that as part of the contour work? 
No, gravel extraction would be outside the scope of the contour, the, out of the scope of these projects. Okay, so okay. through the chair, um, I'm, I'm aware of some of those areas that actually feed into that contour section and they're certainly on our work works program this year. Okay, can we, was that the works program that was, you would help the community with and that's available, is it? I can't remember if that's one that we've seen or not. No, it's it's just for this year. Yeah. No, you haven't seen it. And could the could we see that works program? What was that? Yes, when we've completed it. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I thought cool. I, I thought we'd got through that. We we're into this financial year, so we might have it. Sorry. Sorry. Cool. Thanks, Kate. No. Hurry. Right. Right. Question. I think for him on number ten which talks about, oh, sorry, num, yes, number 10. Um, extra $280,000 over $500,000. Big overrun. I take it that the plan is for 50000 of that to be pay, sort of rearranged from another project. But my question is, is this intended to be a request to us for that money or is it something that you PIM have decided that is appropriately with within your increase in the I'm not saying it isn't I'm, and I'm not I'm not criticizing the choice of doing it so, so where's the money coming from where's the money coming from is this the first we've heard of it, about it how would it usually come to us at the big amount of money to just sort of okay because yeah. it's some old yeah. Thing, not um, Evans, I think. No, no, quite a good question. Uh, uh, it is a variation, a significant one. And, and when I think, um, Brett, when I talked to you about it, it, it was simply that we'd, we'd probably budgeted too little to start with, hadn't we? And, um, and there were some other issues too. And, and I think we were finding some savings from elsewhere. But, um, but uh, yeah, look, I'm. I'm not fully clear on whether uh, that needed to come back to council or not because I wasn't fully aware of that. Uh, to be perfectly honest, Hillary. My understanding is it was a subsequent condition of consent. Is that correct? Oh, the various drivers as to why there's a difference between the yeah. estimate and the but the need for the telemetry and the IT cost. What well, okay. our contractor prices are compared to our estimate, all sorts of reasons. Okay. Yeah. Could could we have um, just by way of email or something, some report back as to how that happened because the odd quarter of a million dollars here and there is of concern to the budgetary. Sorry, is this a problem? No, it's not. Uh, through the chair, I think I might rescue our interim <laughs> CE on this. Um, I think it's the wording um, on that section that, that's saying it's an additional cost of 280000 We have not actually exceeded any budget approvals. Um, what, what we're saying with Robson's Lagoon is we already had uh, financial year 1920 budget allocation in the um, LTP and annual plan. But when we went to um, the, the shovel ready applications, we only put in um, the amounts for this long-term plan. So we're not actually asking for additional funding that isn't already approved. And that was included in the original climate resilience paper of how the funding, where it was coming from. So I think it's just, we we can clarify that with the original funding and showing where the figures I come from. However, that I presume that the original funding wasn't for this purpose. Yes, it was. Was it for yes. Robson Lagoon was has for actually telemetry and automation equipment? Yes. So yes. this, this isn't additional for. No. It's not additional. But the work is the, the automation and, and telemetry equipment is part of the Robson Lagoon project. So when the, the funding was approved through the LTP cycle, it would have been envisaged to complete the project and that work is part of that completion of the project. Um, you could liken it to it uh, being included as part of the design that leads to a possible outcome. If we could <laughs> just have a clarification of what's yep. behind that. Um, if it 
fell off between that and the annual plan or whatever. Just anyway, that would be good. Just a, a brief sort of how how that train moved through the station. I'll try and I'll try and get a better explanation, Hillary, because I'm a bit confused myself now. Uh, the, the paragraph reads pretty clearly, Michelle, no matter how you explain it, it says an additional amount of money. Um, and this is what it's due to. So we do have to explain that to county. Okay. So we'll leave that to Pam and Gavin and team to, to respond. Thanks for that question, Hillary. Thank you. Um, Michael Baker. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. Uh, listening to this discussion over the last half hour or so, uh, the constant theme that has come up from councillors of big gravel management in the beds of rivers. Uh, and it's, I don't want to sound ageist here, but it's reminded me so much of my days as a young newspaper reporter sitting in on the Southland County Council, the Wallace County Council, the Matara Borough Council. Every one of those meetings, if there had been a recent flood event, and there nearly always had been, uh, was councillors saying to their engineers, why don't you take more gravel out of the river? It would solve the problem. That's what our ratepayers are telling us. They understand the river better than you do, Mr. Engineer, the councillors would so often say. And today we've heard the same arguments from councillors about the Kauru, about the Tairi, about the Clutha. And I think it's time that our <coughs> engineering staff, particularly Michelle Yu, as a, a river specialist, put together a little paper reminding us of what role gravel extraction can play and is allowed to play in the management of flood risk in the beds of rivers. And how this relates now to the modern concept of let the river be a river of Tamana or Tawai, bring all those things together to remind uh, present and future councillors of where gravel extraction sits in terms of flood management. Is that a reasonable suggestion? Wouldn't have to be a big paper, just a, a series of points over a couple of pages maybe about what can and cannot be done through gravel extraction. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Well said, Michael. Can I provide some assistance? Council Scott, so there's actually a gravel extraction topic in the region wide provisions for the land and water regional plan that we talk about. And that's because we don't need to do a separate paper. We're covering it in the issue. Oh. Did you hear that, Michael? That it's no, I, I, I could, if that was a neater, I couldn't hear it. It's part of the um, land and water regional plan that there's a section that specifically focuses on that. Good. Neater. And, and so that process and that understanding will have to be articulated. Yeah. I'm, through the chair, I'm aware of that. And yeah. I alluded to that in the first paper that we were actively involved in that oh. with natural hazards. Okay. Yeah. So we, we look forward to that process. And your point, nevertheless, was well made, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Kevin. Uh, and then we'll just, wrap up, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I'm, I'm happy to move the two. And Gary, sorry. Oh, sorry, Gary's got a question first. Do you want to go first? I do have a quick question. Yeah, yeah you go. Yeah, it's not really it's a question. Was, uh, and question time, not a yeah. question. Yeah. That's okay. I will be a question. <laughs> you don't need a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's... Um, <laughs> do you want to make a speech, Gary? No, 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 I want to ask a quick question. I was trying to avert a speech. Okay. Um, <laughs> giving you the opportunity. The new structures, the, the new structures that have been completed there, is the water level quite dynamic. I'm, just, I'm curious as to why there is so little freeboard around those structures and then the the new bridge or the box that's a box culvert or the double box culvert has no cover over it. This is late this is the Robson yeah. pictures. Yeah. And I was having those too. Um, what page is that on Gary? Uh, that's on page 98. I'm just surprised to see a box culvert structure with no cover over the top of it. So I think mean Manufacturers' recommendations are that they have a level of cover over them, but there'll be—I'm sure there'll be a genuine engineering reason as to why that has been constructed that way. And there's also no rock armouring outside the um, the headwalls 
So is there, it, it must be that that water level is quite dynamic, that you don't get substantial break of flows in that area, that those structures are able to build at that way at, a, at almost a peak level capacity like that, is that correct? Through the chair, um, I'll start this question and you can yes. finish it. Um, the, the structure that's been designed um, has been designed around the consent requirements of balancing um, the, the levels in the lagoon. Um, the question about the rock armouring and the cover over the culvert, um, we were actually just discussing that. We, I'll hand over to you today. Uh, so you're, you're quite right. The, the level in the lagoon is reasonably dynamic. It doesn't flow at a high level velocity, it tends to go up and come, come down. The structures are designed to be overtopped. Um, we know the whole area floods to quite a high level and they will be overtopped and they will be submerged in flood. Um, in terms of cover over the, the box culvert structures, um, it is just an access track. It's not a, a road as such or um, they are installed as to the design. The design has been completed by the supplier and that sort of thing. So that's Quite comfortable from that point of view. Um, and in terms of scour and rock armouring, um, again, they're not high velocity areas. So we wouldn't normally put heavy armouring around that, that sort of structure. And saying that we did a little bit of scour around the, the box call with the, the gate on it, which we're addressing at the moment. Okay, you get them the, the one with the sluice gate on it looked quite vulnerable. Uh, no, look, that's fine. Just answering the question. Thank you. Oh, uh, just sneaking down the Clutha. Uh, so we went and looked at the Riverbank Road before uh, you started your work on it, uh, which was part of our bus tour. Yeah. Uh, so that's been in place, and the old Clutha's come up a wee bit. So you're happy with the, uh, that it's worked, obviously, because you haven't come back with some horrible pitches. So. Yeah. So from the floods we have, it seems to be performing pretty yeah. well here. Yeah, yeah just a little, little second. So look, I'm happy to move, and uh, thanks for the, the very good work on this topic that's uh, that's happening, and obviously we're getting yeah a very good uh, piece of infrastructure finished once we've done those work. So I'll second that. Cool. I'm just looking for the, oh, here we go, the recommendation to note the report and note the progress with OSS Climate Resilience Program, yeah? And so we've got to move it, Kevin, that's second, uh, Hillary. I'll put the motion. Those for I against carry. Thank you. Thank you, the and the team and the reps and gathering for today's work. Look, there's a lot of work going on out there, so thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for your transparency on it. Thank you. We had to room. We could have gone off with a bulldozer and got something gravel out of the river, and no one would have noticed. Well, I have a gem for the show from yesterday. <laughs> We do need to get excluded. Oh, we've got a public excluded. Oh, gee, I'm very happy to move the minutes when it's done, so. Hang on a minute. So and I'll second them. <laughs> Liz, yeah. you get that? <laughs> I see. Let's go in public excluded. So, Katie, did you move? Katie, yes. You've moved in public excluded. Hillary did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.